to date, they say we've lost about 17 to 20 percent of the Amazon rainforest. Scientists are warning that if we continue to lose so much of this basin that we could go past a tipping point where the moisture from the Amazon rainforest isn't able to create that weather system and the rainforest dries out and you stop getting rain and then you see the ecosystem collapse. We don't protect this area now. We're going to continue losing crucial parts of the Amazon rainforest. I was 18 years old the first time I came, and the jungle to me was like going into, it was like walking into Avatar or Jurassic Park. It, was, it seemed like something more amazing than, than I thought could happen in real life. When I first came here, I partnered up with Juan Julio Duran, JJ, who's a local indigenous conservationist, and he's the one that opened the whole Amazon to me. And it was always his dream to protect this type of pure wild, this pristine nature. And so JJ and I started exploring the forest and walking through the Amazon with a, with a, with a native person who spent his entire life learning the habits of the birds and the mammals and the medicines and the indigenous wisdom that he carries in his head. And so we would be exploring these pristine streams where there are these giant trees and cathedral ceilings and it was so beautiful. And then the, really the, the most important thing that happened, the most devastating thing that happened is that one of the places that we used to love to go, we went there one day to try and walk through this stream and it was burned to the ground. This forest, when it's cleared, you can't replace a 500-year-old tree. That's a skyscraper of life that has been accumulating these species for centuries. Reptiles, amphibians, birds, mammals, there's so much diversity on every single tree, so losing those creates a hole in the forest that it's, very, that it's going to take centuries to get back. And so one of the things that we encountered when we first started was that we thought there has to be someone who can do something about this. But what JJ taught me was, when you're out this far deep into the Amazon, there is no one. Seeing that ancient place that we loved so much, where there was so much life that you can't even begin to understand how complex the ecosystem is, and seeing that destroyed for nothing changes you. We don't, we don't have centuries. We need to protect these ecosystems now. For the animals living in these forests, right now is when it's important. If we lose these, these ecosystems, if we lose these wild places, they'll never come back. I think this is honestly the most crucial moment in human history because the fate of the natural world and the, the health of the biomes that keep us alive and healthy is actually being threatened. And we have the chance to change that trajectory, to change the narrative of conservation and make a healthier world. I basically wanted to come to the Amazon in general, but I didn't really know where to start. And I ran into social media, some photos of people finding huge anacondas in this region. So that's pretty much why I chose this part of the Peruvian Amazon. So I've been working mainly in the areas of Las Piedras and Tambopata. It's actually pretty hard to find the animals here, like the reptiles and amphibians. But what's amazing here is the biodiversity it has. In terms of caimans, for example, in this particular region, you're mainly going to find three of those, which are the black caiman, it's the biggest one. It can reach up to like five meters, it's like insanely big. And then you have the white caiman, which is the most common one, and we caught some here with, with Cedric uh, on our tour. And also the dwarf or smooth-fronted caiman. Uh, that's like a smaller species of caiman, like super armored. They generally live inside the forest, in the swamps and the creeks. One of the main targets that people come to this region to find are the boas. We have five boa species, uh, starting of course for the anaconda, which is really hard to find. Then you have the red-tailed boa, or the boa constrictor. 
Uh, and then there's other three species that are really cool. Uh, the Amazon tree boa, which is a pretty common species in this area. It's, they call it also the slender tree boa. It's, it can reach up to two meters, but it's a thin uh, arboreal snake. They also vary a lot in colors and patterns. So you can find them very often, but not everyone's gonna be uh, similar to the other. And then you have the other two boas, which I think are one of my favorite ones the emerald tree boa and the rainbow boa. Really hard to find, the rainbow boa is, a, is a, more common than the emerald for sure. Uh, the rainbow has more terrestrial habits and the emerald tree boa lives up high in the canopy and that's one of the reasons why it's so hard to find. My goal for these next years, I think, is to focus more on guiding, you know, grabbing all this knowledge I got and use it with people, you know, teach people the things I know and also keep learning, always keep learning. Like, I, I'm not an expert, not even close, so I, I, wanna, I wanna keep learning in this process. The official NGO was, began in 2015, but, uh, Paul and JJ thought about conserving this area for, for years before. So the group of us uh, got together and, and Jungle Keepers formed. The Las Piedras River, it's one of the most pristine areas left in the Peruvian Amazon, actually in all of the Amazon. This whole area is divided into concessions and each concession is different. There's Brazil nut concessions, so all of Jungle Keepers concessions are Brazil nut. And further upriver, they become timber concessions. So the, the thing is, if we're a Brazil nut concession, we have to harvest Brazil nut, right? And if we don't, we get a little fine. The timber concessions have a quota that they could harvest. However, most of the time they go above their quota. The other thing that's occurring here a lot is illegal agriculture. People come in and it's not their land and they start deforesting for agriculture. And we've seen it and we've used drones and you could see like the openings and the clearings. We've also seen people in action cutting down trees in another concession that, that again does not belong to them. And this area at the beginning was deforested for the rubber. Then it was like the mahogany boom. Presently it's uh, the shiwaku trees, the ironwood trees. So there's a lot of illegal logging that is occurring and at an increasing rate, which means we have to work at, a, at an increasing rate to protect it. That's why it was so important for the NGO to make it their mission and their vision to protect this area, to kind of create a corridor of protected land. And we do this primarily by working with local and indigenous rangers, actually. Seven out of our 11 rangers are indigenous. And they're great rangers because they know the forest so well. I mean, it's their land, right? So in order for this to work, we have to collaborate and work together. We have 11 rangers right now, and we protect almost 50,000 acres of land. It's a lot. We want to protect, we, we want to, we, we have to protect more. And as we protect more, we have to increase our ranger team. I know working for Jungle Keepers has uh, changed the course of my life. And uh, yeah, I love what, I, what I'm doing. I do because I see dif a difference. I see a difference in this area that we're actually effective in stopping illegal activity within our, what, we, what we're protecting. I love this area. I love what we do. I believe in our vision. I think one of the most rewarding things for me is working with Indigenous communities. I think that's, that's been a, a game changer. Over the past few years as we've been growing Jungle Keepers, we've been noticing that as we make small strides the extractive forces that we're fighting are making big strides. So there are huge logging companies coming in now bringing heavy machinery. They're cutting roads behind the areas that we protect. We're literally in a race against time to save this forest. And so every night that I fall asleep, I think about the fact that all of these howler monkeys and spider monkeys and jaguars, every little snake and butterfly in this forest will be bulldozed. What was once wilderness is going to become just someone's backyard if we fail at what we're doing. And so we really have about a three-year timeline. You know, when I first came to this river, 
18 years ago, you could see jaguars on the beaches. You could see black caiman on the river. There were anacondas here, and all of those things have vanished. And it's not too late to bring it back. Currently, Jungle Keepers protects 50,000 acres of this rainforest, but we need to get to about 300,000 acres going along the entire rivershed. We'll essentially be connecting already established protected areas with this newly protected area and establishing the largest network of protected areas in the Amazon rainforest. Getting this far has been incredibly difficult, but what we've discovered is that it's not grant writing, it's not that traditional stuff, it's by telling stories, explaining to people that there are still places that are wild and pristine and ruled by great trees and wildlife, and, and that is something that seems important to people. And even for the other people that don't care about nature, understanding that, you know, like Carl Sagan said, if you can't breathe the air and drink the water, nothing else you're interested in is going to happen. We need on a planetary level, as a global society, we need the Amazon rainforest. It doesn't matter whether you live in Lima or New York or Tokyo, it doesn't matter. You need these systems to keep the global system healthy. It's all connected.